Welcome to Econa Day Unplugged. Today is Tuesday, June 5th. With me today are Jeremy Hawkins in London and Mark Pender in Pennsylvania. I am Ann Picker, Econa Day's Chief Economist. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say that this has been a very busy week on the tariff front. Uh, President Trump imposed cat tariffs on Canada, Mexico, and the EU on Friday. In return, retaliatory tariffs have been placed on U.S. goods as well, escalating bad feelings between what was were close allies of the U.S. The U.S. move has been widely denounced globally. There was no communique at the end of the group of seven finance ministers that met last weekend. These meetings traditionally precede the group of seven heads of state meetings following usually about a week later, and in this case on June 8th and June 9th in Canada. Uh, tariffs are a tax by definition. Uh, recently imposed U.S. tariffs are supposed to hand market power to American metal producers, allowing them to raise prices. In that respect, so far, they seem to be succeeding. Over recent months, premiums for American steel and aluminum over metal brought in from Europe or Asia has sur have surged. But in this case, also have uh, allies have lined up to denounce the tariffs. Even the United Steel Workers, previously supportive of trade restrictions, have criticized the action. The EU has been preparing for retaliation for months, and on the day of the announcement of the U.S. tariffs, Canada and Mexico each published tariff lists detailing plans to hit American exports of steel, aluminum, sausages, pizza, whiskey, peanut butter, and Canadian maple syrup as well. The indirect effects or knock-on effects of tariffs are likely to have a bigger impact as they work through the various economies. Jeremy? Yeah, it's interesting on that note. I noticed just looking at some of the IMF studies. I mean, they ran their model and um, I think it was middle of last year and they were suggesting that a 10% rise in import tariffs in, U in the US, which is reciprocated by the rest of the world, would lead to a 1% fall in world trade and a half a percentage fall in world GDP. Now, I mean, that's just the, the estimate what the IMF are saying, but it does give some kind of idea about just how important this uh, tariff issue could become if indeed it starts become more general rather than just on the, the kind of goods and services which are being talked about at the moment. Anyway, as you said, Europe's certainly not too happy about things at the moment, and it's going to be interesting to see just how this pans out, because, of course, for Europe, the real risk is that if we do see these tariffs having a major effect, uh, it's going to start hitting uh, business confidence at a time when you know, Europe is still trying to get its economic recovery going at full steam to push inflation higher. So it could well end up with the ECB having to keep interest rates uh, low for that much longer than might otherwise have been the case. Um, with regards, though, to the economics as we stand at the moment in the Eurozone, we did see last week a surprisingly sharp jump in Eurozone inflation in the flash figures uh, for May. Uh, that came in at 1.9% year on year, up from just 1.2% in the final April figures. And that certainly caught people by surprise. But I think as we talked about before, there's been a lot of distortions, be it Easter, be it weather and various other factors in the, in the monthly figures of late. So I wouldn't necessarily put too much stock by that. And indeed, if you look at the, the narrowest of the underlying measures, the core measure, um, that was up at 1.1%, by all means, well up from 0.7% in April. But really, that just takes us back into the old very tight band we've seen over, over the last year or so. So bottom line is notwithstanding the acceleration in the headline inflation figure reported last week, underlying trends really continue to move sideways. And at the same time, most of the real side data from Eurozone continues to look pretty soft. 
Um, today we had uh, the April retail sales volumes, which are up just 0.1 percent on the month. And bear in mind, this is real terms, so we're talking about you know what's going on at the volume level. So again, that suggests that the consumer sector is still pretty sluggish. Uh, we also had confirmation of a weak suite of uh, com composite output uh, indices in the PMIs for May. So little indication there of any kind of recovery in May either. So it looks as if uh, second quarter GDP growth in the eurozone is going to be pretty sluggish. And that's going to be interesting because next week we'll get the ECB meeting when they'll be updating their economic forecasts. And those are the forecasts which will really help to determine what the ECB is going to do with regard to its quantitative easing once we get into uh, the supposed soft soft end date in September. So that is very much going to be a focal point for the market next week. I just quickly round off on some of the politics. Um, last week, we spent a fair time talking about the political uh, mess that is Italy at the moment and the uh, potential implications for Eurozone financial markets and Euros, Euro in particular. Well, the good news there is that we do now have a government. Um, indeed, it's, it's kind of the old government is one which is supposed to be coming in in the first place, uh, but it now arrives with a much less anti-Euro a uh, um, finance minister that's been that's expected to be passed by the Italian Parliament today and tomorrow in its two uh, chambers. Um, the good news there then is that you know, it rules out the risk of early general elections, which would be seen as a referendum on the euro. The bad news is very much so that you know the new coalition government is the one which was supposed to be coming in, which has been talking about adopting fiscal policies that completely flaunt EU EU rules. Um, it's already talking about uh, increasing its debt levels, and if we were to see that when we've got debt as much as we have in Italy at the moment, we could end up with some kind of Greek style debt crisis. So bottom line for investors, don't take your eye off Italy because a lot of potential nasty things still to happen in the pipeline over there. That's my lot. Thank you, Jeremy. Mark, still yeah. raving about the good employment report well, from last Friday. <laughs> I, I, yes. Well, that's, a, that's actually a, a critical thing. The, um, the full employment, what we're Reaching here, but I also like to add uh, motorcycles, you know, to your uh, list <laughs> of um, of things that are having uh, having tariffs on. So, um, uh, but uh, and also I'd like to point, you know, uh, uh, there's more. There is uh, immediate in, uh, economic information on these um, on the tariff effects. I know that institutions like the New York Fed, for instance, they do uh, long-term uh, uh, models on what these uh, can uh, produce. But really, uh, these are it's this kind of unknown territory. So um, we can look uh, also at the immediate uh, responses. We're getting those, uh, for instance, in today's ISM non-manufacturing report, today's uh, June 5th. Um, and Tuesday, June fifth, and uh, and purchasers are reporting uh, uh, lots of uh, of uncertainty, uh, lots of extra work uh, trying to get prices um, higher. Uh, actually, talking among themselves about a second half uh, increase in prices, and this is very significant because price. Uh, uh, hikes are congested at the uh, beginning of the year. They they don't pop up in, in quantity uh, halfway through, and uh, these reports that we've been getting from these small sample surveys, such as the ISM, have been unusually and uniformly strong in May. Um, they have been strong all along, and now they are at a very heightened uh, uh, signs of supply of stress in the supply chain. Delivery times are very, very slow. Uh, backlogs, uh, backlog orders are rising uh, uh, very, very much. And uh, em uh, employers typically have to uh, hire or um, uh, producers have to hire new employees to work down these backlogs. So this is another sign of very strong employment. And that brings us to, I think, w what's really the critical thing for the U.S. economy right now, and that is uh, full employment. We had job openings today in today's JOLTS report, and they're at about 6.5, uh, 6.6 6 million um, the number of unemployed that we got in yesterday's uh, last week's employment, very strong employment report, was six million. And this is the first time in 20 years of, of such records that we, uh, this has happened. So um, uh, the Federal Reserve, which uh, reached its uh, stated um, employment goals a year and a half ago, two years ago uh, and have been you know, uh, uh, sidestepping those questions about full employment, it's going to become more and more hard to do that. And the more, uh, the less slack you have in the employment 
uh, situation um, it means the less uh, chance for demand growth, general demand growth, new people coming in, spending money. And that's the same thing we're getting with the trade. We're getting a diminishing in, in cross-border activity. So here, here are two, uh, looking at the demand side, two factors that are pointing to slowing demand growth. And, um, and I think we're seeing that in the two-year, 10-year U.S. Treasury curve. We're seeing now a tightening, uh, and we're about 30 basis points between the two. And uh, when these go up, the Federal Reserve officials pay attention because when they meet is when uh, recessions often happen. Thanks, Mark. Next week should be a very interesting week with the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, and the ECB all issuing monetary policy statements. Until next week.